Hi, it's Jessica DeMassa with WTF Health, and I have David Ewing Duncan. He is a journalist, a big thinker, an author of 10 different books, the latest being Talking to Robots. So David, talk to me about Talking to Robots. Are, are the overlords taking over, um, and that's it? It's the end of humanity as we know it? Yeah, that's it. That's a really short book. This was a great interview. No. <laughs> I really appreciate this interview. No, so, so talk about the concept of the book, because this is actually really, really cool. You've got different robots taking on different things in our lives. So so explain this a little bit. So there are 24 robots in here, and the idea is I'm a nonfiction writer, and I write about technology, mostly about biotech and, and life, life science technologies. But this is about uh, different fields, technologies, and what's happening in the present for something like you know, like a doctor bot, but it's also a warrior bot. You know, all the automated warfare systems. It's a teddy bear bot for kids. It's of course a sex bot. You got to have that in there. Oh, yeah, um, it sells those books, right? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> And so I report on what's going on in the present in each of these robots, um, but the book is actually told from the future. So there's a narrator that's not identified, but he, she, or it, it could be a robot, oh. knows what's going to happen. And so it's both nonfiction reporting, like I would do in a story for like Wired or something, but it's fictional stories. And these each have a plot. It's kind of a black mirror, although some of them are more utopic than that. Um, some of them are not, though. Oh. So and, talk to us about a good one. Like, what's a good robot? Like, how does one end positively? Well, a lot of them, we almost go to the brink, and then we figure it out, because uh, this is the way I think technology works. You know, we love technology when it comes out, like, say, the car. The you know, early automobiles were extraordinarily dangerous. <laughs> There's certainly no seat belts, you know, no nothing. And people died all the time, and we still have a problem with that. But we kind of learn what you know, is, is the positive and what, what is the negative about technology. So that happens a lot. That's a, a big theme in the book. Okay. But I don't know, in one of them, Warrior Bot, Basically, there are only a few humans left when it starts in the future, and you know the robots, and we turn them on to be automated, you know, for warfare, which we're very close to doing right now, by the way. True. <laughs> it turns out that they were programmed to win in this story, like, you know, to win, and so they start attacking each other, and they basically wipe out everybody, and the world is saved by a little girl. I won't give away this story. Oh, okay. So in the end, even though most, almost everybody's died, we do survive. So there's that one, but there's, there's fun and ones. Like, can you tell us about a happy one? And this is the one you've selected. I love that. All right, so, so give me a, a, a bad case scenario one then. <laughs> well, there's a mortal me bot, the, the way the book ends. And by the way, I interview human be beings. I call them my human collaborators. Mm -hmm. So each chapter has somebody like Kevin Kelly or Tim O'Reilly or Brian Greene, the physicist. You have Esther Perel in your book too. I do I have love Esther Perel, yes. yeah. And that's obviously the sex bot. Um, and also a, a couple of other, of, of my amazing friends that are, are relationship therapists. And, well, that was one that turned out pretty well. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> so, and by the way... It, there was a happy ending in that one? Oh, my yeah. God, I had to. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Because <laughs> I, you know, like everybody else, well, who follows this stuff, you know, I go, I, I, I'm almost being, like, oversaturated with all the dystopic uh, stories on TV, yeah. you know, on Netflix, on, you know, films. It's like, you know, we're all just going to die every which way. It's like, how many horrible ways through zombies, you know, <laughs> apocalypse, whatever, you know, Disease. climate change. Yeah. <laughs> so how many horrible ways can we all die? And so I did want to counter that. And it's interesting, a lot of the reviewers said that I was, you know, like, cautiously optimistic, even as I was, you know, in some cases, things didn't turn out so well. Well, that's good. All right, so draw a parallel to me, I guess, to, to healthcare. So healthcare is something that you've covered extensively as a journalist. You've written books about it. Um, you actually, I remember meeting you at the first time I met you, you were talking to me about how you were like the, the single human who had the most data on themselves from a healthcare perspective. It was how many terabytes of data? Well, back then it was only 15. Right, only, only 15. 15. And this was and when? That well, the book Date I wrote. Yourself. Yeah, the, the book I wrote on that was hundreds of years ago. No, because I'm living a very long time. Mm -hmm. No, I'm kidding. But you I did are write a robot. Yeah, well, I did write a book on longevity. Yeah, but that was actually the last one. But um, so it was called the Experimental Man Project, mm -hmm. and it actually started kind of, you know, basically I wasn't expecting to do it. Back in 2001, I was given the assignment at Wired Magazine to write about the Human Genome Project. And I looked at this and I was like, this is so boring. It's like four letters of code, you know, the genetic code. And how do I make this interesting? Because we didn't know anything about it then, right? The, were the results or how it affected? I mean, there was some knowledge, but the, there wasn't any general knowledge. So I asked if I could be tested. It turns out I was one of the first humans to ever be sequenced. Oh, no way. 
okay. Yeah, so that's how this started. And so I, it humanized the story to have a real person yeah, do it. Yeah, for sure. And I later tested members of my family, like my kids and, and uh, my parents. And so I, this got me going. And I ended up taking like basically every medical test on the planet. And the book came out, it's crazy, it was 10 years ago, it was 2009. So that was the 15 terabytes of data. Yeah. But I'm doing Experimental Man 2, and I'm actually calling it now Experimental People because we're getting a lot of other people that are working on it. And I've already collected probably 20 terabytes of data just in the last year and a half. And it took me 10 years before to collect 15. So that's, this gives you some idea of the scale of how much data we're producing right now. I want to talk about this. I want to talk about the data we're producing. And I want to go back to the conversation about robots because I think, you know, covering health tech, it's like, you know, you hear a lot about there's, there are certain fears in the industry about how much data we're producing and who's owning our data and the real data privacy questions mm -hmm. there, morally and ethically. But then also on the robot side, you know, with all of this data, we're applying, you know, algorithms, we're empowering robots to take jobs that, you know, people once had. I mean, there's yeah. like a whole thing about radiologists being displaced by, you know, AI um, enabled technology that can read scans, you know, more effectively yeah. over time. So, I mean, what do you think? Weigh in on this. As somebody who's kind of looked at this and studied this and watched this evolve over the last 10 years, should healthcare fear technology? Well, first of all, it's already here, although healthcare in many ways at least in where the patients are concerned, is, is sort of behind some other industries. It yeah. moves very slowly. But um, the reality is that, um, you know, if we're going to ever make sense of all this data we're collecting, we, we, we have to have the AI. We have to have the machine learning. And so there's that aspect of it. But I always say, you know, since I wrote the book and I've been paying attention to, like, you know, the impacts of, say, social media privacy and some other areas outside of medicine, that that's just a dress rehearsal for our health data. It's not quite there yet like mm -hmm. it is for social media data, but it will be. And, you know, are we going to have the same sort of abuses of our genetic data or our metabolomic data or microbiome data? I mean, you know, it's basically going to be collected and stored in the same way. And there will be companies, if they're not stopped, or, or entities that will use it to sell you things. And imagine being sold something based on, like, the mapping of your brain. Yeah, I mean, that's terrifying, right? I mean, because it knows you better than you know yourself almost. Yeah. In fact, I've, I've had some of those experiments, like MRI scans that test you. Like, there's something called neuroeconomics, and they will show you pictures of products, and you're supposed to rate them. You're, you're, you're there in the MRI machine, and you're laying back, and blah, blah, blah. And you're looking in these goggles, and they're showing you products. You're supposed to rate them from 1 to 10 on a little clicker that you're yeah. holding in your hand. So you rate it like, I don't know, like an 8. But your brain scan is rating it as a 2 or vice versa. So they're learning about what our brains really like. And my favorite one of this is, I was shown a poster of the movie Dodgeball. You know, it's a stupid, yeah. moronic movie, right? Yeah. And because, you know, I'm a big, sophisticated guy, I gave it, I don't know, I think I gave it a three. Okay, my brain gave it a 10. <laughs> the inner 14 year Your inner boy. Dodgeball yes, fan. Exactly, uh huh. Exactly. We all know, we all know who's watching what. Yeah, but that's, that's, a pretty crude version of the technology that's going to be No, existing. but I mean, imagine the things that that could be applied to. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's kind of scary to think that my brain added me like that, yeah. too. I mean, so, okay, so answer my question. So, I guess in healthcare, I mean, should we be afraid of technology? I mean, there are there are these ways that it could be implemented that are particularly, I mean, they're, they're frightening. I mean, should we be afraid of it? Well, I'm giving a talk now called Why We Love and Fear Technology. And I've, I thought I invented a term, but actually it's been used before, but it's called technophrenia, which I think is what we're feeling right now. You know, we, we love, love, love our smartphones, but we also, we're all getting cricks in our necks. And we're yeah. all like, oh my God, you know, turn off the phone at night. You know, I mean, we're, we're sort of at least anxious about it, if not actually kind of scared. Yeah. And you can really, I mean, all technology, by the way, throughout history has been that way. There's been ups, upsides and downsides Absolutely. and things that we've loved and things that we've feared. And my sense is that we we should fear it. And, you know, healthcare too, and all aspects. And in fact, we need to listen to those fears. We need to understand them and process them. Uh, hopefully before the, you know, the new robots are implemented. Otherwise, you know, we may not have a chance because they, because they're, they're, they're going to be very smart. And they're going to move very fast and they're going to be, you know, having all this data in their giant brains. It may be too late if we don't think about it beforehand. Well, luckily for us, you are cautiously optimistic. So we'll keep it at that. The book is Talking to Robots. David, you and Duncan, thank you so much for joining us. It's thank a pleasure you. to talk to you about this. I'm Jessica Damasa with WTF Health. Thanks so much for watching.